a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I think I have uh, the privilege to talk to the smartest audience of the entire workshop because you know everything about neuromodulation now. What I thought I'll do is um, I have popped in questions in between, questions about how you would proceed to tackle certain issues that basically we were faced with. And I just want to see you know, what type of ideas you would come up with and then see how that matches with, with what, what we and others have done in the field. All right, so um, hippocampal dependent memory is the main topic. And um, just to acknowledge the people who, who really helped me with uh, uh, setting up these presentations, uh, they are the ones really who are behind all the science that I'm going to present. And they uh, also sent me you know, their most wonderful slides. Um, and uh, so let's um, set the stage for the talk a bit. Um, I know every, every memory talk kind of begins with HM, with patient HM, which you all know about. But um, I think in this uh, particular case, uh, it's, it's, it's um, uh, important because we have to realize that 60 years after the case of HM has pointed us to the temporal lobes as a very important structure for memory, we still know very little about that, um, about how memory works. And, um, and uh, there are a number of questions that are really critical about memory that we haven't really started to tackle systematically. So for instance, where in the brain are experiences represented? How precise are they? How fast do we actually sample information during encoding as we experience them? How is information stabilized? How does information decay? How is information modified, compre compressed, or resampled uh, after uh, encoding over time? These are issues that are very relevant when you um, want to understand uh, dysfunctions of memory. And uh, for our work, uh, the most relevant um, topic or, or the, ones that, the one topic that we are currently interested with uh, or working on is, is uh, Alzheimer's disease. You know, without having a good understanding of all this, it's very hard to make progress in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that's one, one perspective. This is what you could see as a representational perspective. And then there's another perspective, which um, is a more neuromodulatory uh, perspective. And here we tackle, you know, here the relevant questions are, how do experiences become relevant in the first place to be encoded in memory? How do they interact with attention, motivation, reward, approach, and avoidance? And uh, how do they interact um, with um, particularly the tendencies that are enshrined in the uh, basal ganglia circuits, such as Pavlovian tendencies and instrumental choices? So aside from the representational perspective, we have this you know, very complex neuromodulatory perspective that we still don't understand. And then the interaction between the two, of course, is very relevant. And we haven't even really started to look at that interaction. Um, so what I try to do in this talk is I really, uh, in the two sessions is to separate, basically, um, the way we approach memory dysfunction and neurodegeneration exactly along this pers you know, these two perspectives. So in the first talk, I will um, tell you how we do research on the representational aspect of memory dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease. And in the second part, um, we will discuss a neuromodulatory perspective and how they could tie together. Um, I have been also asked by uh, Trevor and Martin to um, have to also mention um, computational approaches. So I will do that in both parts. Um, there are interesting computational approaches that help you understanding the representational um, uh, failures in Alzheimer's disease. And there are, of course, very interesting computational approaches to look at the neuromodulatory perspective. Um, as you all know, in Alzheimer's disease, we are faced with a situation that we have um, two main culprits, that's amyloid and tau. But disease-modifying treatments, particularly targeting amyloid thus far, have 
uh, failed when they, when they were administered in manifest, manifest Alzheimer's disease. So if you give, if you remove amyloid from a patient, uh, from a patient's brain, uh, when this patient already has dementia, then there is no effect. Although the treatment itself, so the removal um, is effective. Therefore, it's become clear in the field that we need to intervene before dementia, before there is extensive neurodegeneration. This really requires you know, a paradigm shift from the existing model, uh, which is really a volume loss model of, of uh, human memory, of human uh, research, you know, a neurodegeneration model. You look at atrophy, and, um, and then you use atrophy basically as, as the guide in in looking how severe dementia is. Uh, we need to move away from that and, and have to basically embrace a dysfunction model. We need to look much more at function than we did uh, until now. And when I mean function um, or dysfunction, then um, really what's important is that we have both things in mind, the representational dysfunction and the neuromodulatory dysfunction. Currently, these are completely separate fields, and that's also the uh, second challenge uh, that, that we need to bring these types of research really together. Um, so, as I said in the first part, um, I will talk about hippocampal memory networks uh, and, and memory representations and how they are altered in Alzheimer's disease. And in the second part, it will be dopaminergic neuromodulation and uh, its role in memory, particularly memory consolidation. But then also beyond memory, we will look at the interaction between the hippocampus and basal ganglia, um, and uh, also look at the um, locus coeruleus and how we can investigate neurodegeneration in the locus coeruleus in the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease. So let's start with part one, um, just to give you a setting uh, where some of the research I'm going to show you is being done. Uh, this is a newly established German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases. It's a government institute uh, with um, several different sites, although it's one administrative entity. And we are here in the Magdeburg site, and uh, our um, main focus of research is imaging, cognition, and plasticity. And uh, we work together with uh, these different centers. And the interesting thing, you know, the interesting aspect about this uh, structure is that you can do large-scale studies um, and, uh, and uh, uh, have, you know, achieve uh, large sample sizes uh, for the questions that you are trying to, to address um, because it's, this uh, structure works as, as one network, if you wish, where we have very harmonized protocols and research um, methods across the sites. Uh, one study that uh, I will refer to today um, is the DELCODE study. Uh, this is really a study in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So this is a, this, the stage when people uh, don't yet have memory impairment that you can measure with standard neuropsychological tests, but uh, they already have uh, abnormalities of biomarkers, for instance, of amyloid and tau in their CSF. Yeah. Yeah, so um, one approach is that you have many uh, healthy participants who just volunteer for research, and uh, you know, a fraction of them, at least um, at the age of 70, 20% uh, of them will, have, will be biomarker positive. That's one approach. The other approach is that you um, look for people who complain about memory impairment. Uh, we call this subjective memory complainers but don't have neuropsychological test abnormalities. So that's the second source. This group is actually a new group that's emerging as a, let's say, clinical entity. Uh, there's you know, a very strong interest in this group because the idea is that this may be the people who are experiencing subjective decline because their memory is getting worse um, quite rapidly over time. But they have started at a higher point uh, from a higher level, and so in neuropsychological tests, they still perform normal. And um, there's already evidence uh, from our group, but also from other cohorts in, in, uh, in Europe, that it's more likely to be biomarker positive when you have that type of experience. And then we have the mild memory um, 
impaired people, the mild cognitive impairment individuals. Yes. Um, so the, there are no hard data on this, but the, um, the way people are basically considered subjective cognitive decliners includes two to three years of memory complaints. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of data that we have acquired with high resolution imaging at 7 Tesla. Um, I know this is a new technique, but um, uh, the interesting uh, development is that there are now uh, already a lot of these machines in Europe and uh, we have also already formed a network actually of um, uh, these seven Tesla MR imaging machines. Usually you would use a three Tesla machine for human research. Um, so I think this technology is becoming more and more relevant. Uh, like with three Tesla, people are harmonizing the technology and so on. So it is going to become not mainstream, maybe, but uh, or, you know, kind of a standard technology for, for let's say, high-end, high-resolution research. And in Magdeburg, um, we have a 7 Tesla, we have other imaging facilities. This is our Desert NAE building. But let's get back to Alzheimer's disease. So the interesting aspect about Alzheimer's disease is that uh, when you look at the tau pathology, um, in the central nervous system, you have a very local beginning. So the initial uh, onset of tau pathology is in the um, border between the perirhinal and entorhinal cortex, called the um, uh, transentorhinal region. And from there, we have basic, basically a um, spread of pathology along synaptic pathways, uh, and along connected brain regions to the entorhinal, to the rest of the entorhinal cortex, to the hippocampus, to parahippocampal regions, rest of the temporal lobe, and then precuneus, prefrontal regions, and so on. So I think this picture is quite clear, but what we have very little understanding about is what this actually causes in the brain as dysfunction and in memory as a cognitive or, or behavioral impairment. So we have no knowledge, actually, how the different stages of tau pathology relate to um, progressive memory dysfunction. And this is really something we want to, uh, you know, we want to um, address. With amyloid, you have a much more diffuse pathology. Uh, the amyloid pathology, uh, at least in animal studies, is also progressive. But in humans, the picture that you usually see is that um, people stay relatively stable over a decade or so with you know, a widespread amyloid pathology without much dynamics in it. Um, and so therefore, the progressive tau pathology seems to be more linked to progressive decline. But as I said, we have no understanding about the link between the, the uh, anatomical progression and the, the memory profile that we see in individuals. Um, and related to that, we know very little about the me memory impairment in preclinical Alzheimer's disease or, or mild Alzheimer's disease. We know people forget something, but we don't know what they forget. So we have no insight into the representational loss that they experience. And this is also something that I think we need to understand uh, because without that you don't have, you know, you cannot produce good outcome markers, for instance, for therapeutic trials. Um, now, why do you think, do we know so little <laughs> about the impairment in Alzheimer's disease? Why don't we know how tau relates to memory impairment and why don't we know what the representation in a patient looks like? So this is not a difficult question, this is really, uh, <laughs> I just want you to kind of speculate what, what the reason may be. Sorry? Is there a lot of variants? A lot of variants, yeah, yes. I mean, um, now leave aside the difficulty with the disease, just looking at our methodology and how we approach it. What, what have we been doing wrong, basically? Yeah. Yes, yeah, the animal models are different from humans. That's a major problem, yeah. But I think, you know, the uh, animal models have uh, one thing that uh, makes them actually better than what we are doing in humans. Uh, 
and what's what they you know what what are they doing better than what we're doing in humans? Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's true. Um, you know, I think you have the same problem that the field had for, for a long time. Um, you don't see the most obvious uh, thing, and the field didn't see it, and I think still doesn't. The reason is that, that we don't use, you know, we don't use hypothesis-driven assessments, and we have never done so far. Um, when you look at, and with this I mean really the neuropsychological test batteries that we use in Alzheimer's disease. When a patient with Alzheimer's disease comes into a clinical trial or into a research unit, um, this person would receive a neuropsychological assessment that would involve learning a few words, um, you know, trying to, to draw a clock, um, connecting dots uh, in, a, in a fast way, and so on. All these tests have no relationship whatsoever to how, whatsoever to how the brain works. They don't have any anatomical um, relationship to the brain. They have been designed 25 years ago um, because you know, they were thought to pick up a deficit, but they don't inform us about specific uh, representations or processes um, that we are really interested in. And then this is something that animal research really um, you know, is much, much more advanced because the assessments in, uh, that you usually use in animals, um, although most of them are the Morris water maze, at least they target a certain structure. And neuroanatomical tests in humans don't do that. So we have to overcome this. And, and what we really need is you know, a much more cognitive neuroscience driven input into this research field. And that's what we tried in, in, in the um, German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases and other centers are trying as well. Now, looking a bit more closely at, at the progression of tau, what you see uh, and what's quite clear is that the tau uh, accumulation starts in the superficial entorhinal cortex, uh, superficial region of entorhinal cortex, and then proceeds to, to other brain regions. And um, um, you know, people know that you, know, you have that type of uh, progression and have been discussing about what this may mean. And the overarching idea is that um, when you have tau, this means neurodegeneration. So when you have tau in the brain, um, then uh, this is associated with, with atrophy, and, um, and, and, um, and that's, you know, the atrophy then is basically somehow related to the dysfunctional memory impairment. But, um, you know, the problem here is that because we don't have memory tests or, or assessments that target these brain areas, we don't, because we don't have functional measures, we cannot really assess that type of really fundamental um, uh, concept. Um, so what we need basically is to find ways to um, delineate what these structures are actually doing, measure tau pathology in the brain, for instance, by taking cerebrospinal fluid, and then compare the functional and structural consequences of that pathology. Um, so the question that we try to address uh, uh, in, in a large study is, is CSF tau, so the tau accumulation in the cerebrospinal fluid, really an index of neurodegeneration? So is it really related to atrophy, for instance, of the entorhinal cortex? Or is it associated with a functional impairment so, for instance, with a dysfunction of the entorhinal cortex in doing something cognitive independent of, of atrophy. So, let's look at this uh, circuit a bit more closely. So, this is the entorhinal cortex. This is the hippocampus. Um, we know um, from computational theorists quite, you know, we have good hypothesis what this circuit may do. So, the entorhinal cortex uh, provides input. Uh, into the hippocampus, uh, there may be something like a pattern separation process in the dentate gyrus. CA3 may also contribute to pattern separation, but also to pattern completion. And CA1 uh, may do various things, but among, among um, those also um, enable a topolo you know, topologic mapping of these memories to cortical representations. So these are, yeah. 
What, what do you mean? So this model. Yeah. What is it in more complex than we can tell? Oh, sure. I will show you a little bit about, about these different uh, aspects, so particularly about pattern separation and how we can investigate it. And then Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. So we'll talk a bit about pattern separation, not so much about pattern completion today, but uh, about pattern separation. So you could uh, basically have an idea how it's investigated in humans. I don't have slides from animals, but there are kind of complementary approaches in Cambridge, for instance, um, that, can, that are kind of comparable. Now, OK, so let's, um, you, we know that the, this function is starting here in the superficial region. Um, you can see that on high resolution MR, so this would be the superficial aspect of entorhinal cortex. Now imagine you had a wonderful MR scanner and you could, you know, you were able to measure activity just in the superficial aspect, just where you would think the pathology is starting. Um, what kind of task would you use? You can do a functional MR scan. What kind of task would you use to see what this region does? not in a patient study, but to assess, you know, what type of function that region may have. Do you have any, any idea? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, for instance. Water maze, yeah, it's a bit difficult with humans, but uh, okay. <laughs> Sounds like it would, it would be difficult to. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Episodic memory, yeah, what kind of episodic memory? What would you do in, in specifically? Yes? What kind of task? Like should, should you solve the task and then try to understand the brain areas that are involved in that? Okay, so just, yeah, what kind of task though? But that's, that's the issue. You, you define what behavior you want to look at. What, yeah. Say a memory, say a sort of memory, and then see what you're doing. Okay, yeah. Well, yes? Just like a delayed response task. Delayed response? Interesting. Okay, good, yeah. So our candidates, just, uh, um, our candidates were spatial navigation. Um, you know, something that could be looking at grid cells. Uh, that's very complex to do in humans. Um, some form of an association task, um, you know, just associating two objects with each other. Um, that's possible in humans. There have been a lot of fMRI studies. But then we thought, okay, let's do something really simple. Let's, let's just look at scenes, you know, pictures of scenes, because this is something that um, is, is is quite relevant. People with Alzheimer's disease have impaired scene memory. And let's just look at scene novelty. We just present novel and very familiar scenes, and we will assess whether this region, which we know acts as an input into the hippocampus, is activated by novelty. Because that would suggest to us that this is also in humans, it's basically conveying novelty into the hippocampus. So we designed a very simple paradigm where we show people photographic scenes and these scenes are repeated from time to time so they become you know highly some of the scenes become highly familiar and the other ones are presented only once so they are trying unique and novel and all the participant has to do in the scanner is to say is this an in, uh, indoor or outdoor picture so a very simple decision and we also wanted it to be simple because later on we wanted to use this in patient as, patients as well. Outside the scanner then there is a memory test uh, for the novel pictures. We present them again and people have to say whether they remember the test, uh, they, they remember the image. And we measure fMRI here at the stage. And, um, and we use seven Tesla with a very high resolution of 0.8 millimeter. So the entorhinal cortex has a thickness of 3.2 millimeter, which means you can place four voxels along the depth of the entorhinal cortex, yeah. So I guess my question is, the hypothesis here is this picture, and then the picture that you involved in detecting and the novelty? Yes. So the, yes. So the idea is that when you remember an, uh, an image, 
um, there will be a, a memory-related activation. So images that are later remembered will have higher activation than memories that are later forgotten. But that's not the superficial layer of the entorhinal cortex. The superficial of the layer of the entorhinal cortex just responds to novelty. That's the hypothesis. Okay? The activation in the superficial layer doesn't predict whether you remember it. It just says, this is novel, this is not novel. It just puts novelty into the hippocampus. Something else in the hippocampus tells you then what's later remembered or not. That's the hypothesis. And, and this is also, so uh, this is just to show you that we could basically, with this technology, look at the superficial and deep layers. Um, I think we have to move on a bit faster, so I'm just so, and the, uh, we used, um, uh, so what we want to do here really is to look at the superficial layer and compare it to the deep layer. Um, now we cannot really see the layers, so we just, uh, by approximation, divide the entorhinal cortex in three parts. And so we look at the superficial and deep sections. And um, um, now you have to realize one thing about uh, fMRI is fMRI actually never compares activity between two regions. I don't know if you've ever realized that. But usually what you do is you report activation in one region and say it's significant or not. You report activation in another region and say it's significant or not, and then you draw, you, you draw, you, you know, you draw a conclusion. Although, in fact, you wouldn't be allowed, you know, you aren't allowed to draw that conclusion because you have never directly compared the regions with each other. And here, what we want to do is we want to compare the deep and superficial regions directly with each other. Something that's not implemented in SPM or any other fMRI technique. So we ha we had to come up with a completely new analysis tool, um, a computational approach, uh, and we used something that um, was uh, developed um, this class and Stefan in Zurich. Um, it's called multivariate based, and it basically helps you to set up a model um, for both the superficial and deep entorhinal cortex, do model comparison, and then see whether in which region you find more evidence for novelty. Um, then, uh, you know, in which of these two you find more evidence for novelty than, for instance, successful memory. And um, just to cut the sto uh, story short, we find evidence, model evidence for novelty reliable across participants in the superficial layer, but not the deep. Whereas memory success, so whether an image is later remembered or not, is um, signaled by the activity in the deep layer of the entorhinal cortex. That's interesting because the deep layer is the output to the cortex. So the input, everything that's new goes in, and, and, and the output is memory success. Now this would tell us that maybe, you know, if you have tau in that region, maybe that causes a functional impairment in the input to the hippocampus. So the novelty that goes into the hippocampus is somehow representationally corrupted, okay? That would be the consequence of such a, um, such a finding. Yeah? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, so this is really just the beginning of this type of research. Um, and now that the technology is becoming more widespread and other labs can do similar things, I think we will see more of this type of research. But yeah, you are right. So this should be just the beginning to look more, deep, more deeper into this. Okay, so, um, so these data suggest that novelty is related to the input into the circuitry, whereas the memory fate is related to the output. Now, um, we use the same task in this Delcode study, where we have the people with subjective memory complaints, we have people with mild cognitive impairment, and also early Alzheimer's disease, um, to then see how this is related to changes in, in um, CSF biomarkers. Now, uh, in that study, we couldn't use three tes uh, seven Tesla, so we used uh, more standard technology, three Tesla. So now we're look not looking with such a high resolution, but we can at least look at the entorhinal cortex. So this is the data, the first data that we have uh, from this large study. These were data from uh, 400 individuals. Not all of them had CSF biomarkers. So this is the subsample with CSF biomarkers. So first of all, what you see here is the behavioral performance of the individuals in scene memory. Okay, so how well do they recognize the scenes later on? Here are the healthy controls. 
Oh, so, what you, so these are corrected hit rates. So they say this is an old image, and then you subtract false alarms from that when they have a new image that they falsely judge as old. So this is a corrected score here. These are individuals with subjective memory complaints. As you can see, they have complaints, but they are, you know, their performance is the same. Individuals with mild cognitive impairment are obviously impaired. Um, this is actually not very trivial because mild cognitive impairment is usually defined as a verbal memory test score because you know, the defining test is verbal free recall. So it's, not, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting that they are nevertheless impaired. So it seems um, kind of a valid assumption that uh, also the spatial performance is impaired or memory performance is impaired. And then obviously Alzheimer's disease individuals are impaired as well. Now when we look at this corrected hit rate across the entire group, the question is, does it somehow correlate with the, with the CSF biomarkers? So in CSF, we can look at CSF tau. Um, usually, you know, you have total tau and phosphor tau. Total tau seems to be more related to neurodegeneration. That's at least the assumption. Then you have amyloid biomarkers, and here the relevant one is A beta 42. You can do now all sorts of comparisons. You can just look at A beta 42 and tau and phosphor tau, or you can do ratios. And in fact, you find in this special case, you know, uh, quite robust correlations with uh, different variations. So here, what is plotted here is the ratio between um, A beta and phosphor tau, um, uh, because A beta is usually going down and phosphor tau is going up. And so this, this, uh, you know, uh, this ratio uh, should become smaller. And uh, what you can see is quite a nice correlation between the CSF values and, and the behavioral measures. So here, the Alzheimer's patients and the other populations. Um, so that's nice. But more interesting is what happens functionally, because we said we want to see whether the CSF tau pathology is somehow related to, to function. Now, just uh, in the seven Tesla study, we had looked at novelty in a very detailed way. So we compared, um, you know, we looked at the novelty just in the superficial layer. But of course, novelty, when you look at the whole brain, activates a lot of brain regions. And in fact, this, this is a network that is usually activated by the novel images on top of the, you know, over and above the familiar images. So you can see it's a wide network of brain areas. And, uh, you know, this is in a very large population. So the T values are, of course, uh, huge. And then obviously also the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe structures are also activated. Now, the question that we want to ask is, we know tau pathology starts here. What happens if we take the CSF total tau levels and correlate it with the entire brain novelty response? In which areas do we see a correlation between the novelty response and the CSF tau? And if we see one, is that dependent on atrophy or not? So is it dependent on the thickness of that brain region or not? So here's the result. So what you, what you see here is now the only brain region in the entire brain that correlates with the CSF level um, of tau. It actually doesn't matter so much if you take phosphor tau or tau. Um, and the only region is the transentorhinal cortex. And that's really remarkable, because this is the region where you would think that the tau pathology starts. Um, so here we have gender and age as a covariate, so this is not age dependent. Um, here we also have diagnosis as a covariate, so you know, we have um, uh, just to make sure that the correlation is not driven by the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it's really related only to the, to the, to the value of the uh, um, uh, tau uh, in, in the CSF. And more interesting, now we have another covariate here, um, which is the perianterinal thickness. So you can see that it gets a little bit noisier, but the, cor the functional correlation still remains. What this means is that if you have an increasing level of tau in your CSF, your novelty response in the transenterinal cortex decreases, and it doesn't matter if your transenterinal cortex is thin or thick. It's a functional correlation, which means that you know, the tau pathology, as we can measure it with CSF, has a functional consequence. And this is interesting because if you now want to devise, you know, a therapy that's related to tau, for instance, you want to remove tau from the, from the brain, 
then it would be good to have a functional readout, particularly you know, in early developments of drug where you want to have a quick proof of concept study. Do I have target engagement with my drug? And then it's important kind of to have such functional readouts where you know, okay, there's a very specific correlation um, and, and that novelty response should really go up if I remove, yeah. Yeah, um, that's interesting. I think, um, I mean, I, I probably, I don't have the answer to that. Um, uh, we, we decided, you know, at some point to use a bit more natural stimuli for reasons I'm going to show you later on. So um, there, there is something important about these stimuli that we can learn about memory. Because, you know, we, we, we started by saying we want to understand the representational problem. If you have very abstract stimuli, you cannot make good conclusions to what people forget in real life. Okay? Yeah. So, yeah, sorry, so the familiar scenes were already familiarized before they went into the scanner. So they, they were already familiar by that time, but that's a very good question. Okay, now when you use A beta as a covariate, you get Pareto occipital correlations, which is also interesting because this is where, you know, amyloid pathology should be more prom prominent. Now, okay, so that's interesting. Um, we have something about scenes, and there's a correlation with CSF tau levels in, in the transcentral anal cortex. But the question really is, what are we looking at? What's the component process that's impaired? And what type of representation? I mean, scenes are obviously very complex images. They, are, you know, they have all sorts of information in them. So how would you proceed from this point? You want to, you know, you want to now understand what is really impaired? What's the process that's impaired? Okay, we said there's some novelty input and what's the representation that's impaired? What do you know about the representational organization of the medial temporal lobe that you know, would maybe motivate you to look further? Okay, so um, let, let me answer the question. Um, so, you know, we already talked about pattern separation, and I think this may be an important process to look at. When you show people so many photographic images, that you know, no matter how, how distinct you want to make them, will have some overlap, then really the, the important process that will help people to memorize each image is to pattern separate them in their representation. So I think pattern separation is probably an important process, and we know that you know, the, the circuitry is important for pattern separation. Um, but there's, there's another aspect um, which has to do with, with the type of information that comes into the hippocampus. The type of information that comes into the hippocampus is segregated along pathways for objects and scenes. Um, so we have to look at object representations and scene representations separately. Now with pattern separation, and I will go over this very quickly. Um, yeah. Yes, so that's the idea. But um, I will show a bit more about that uh, subsequently. So um, I think for the interest of time, I will just go over this very quickly. Um, you know, there, is, there are models um, that, that basically, of course, come from animal research that, that suggest that if two similar inputs come into the hippocampus with overlapping neuronal representations, what the dentate gyrus is particularly good at is giving them sparse but very segregated representations. So this is what we call pattern separation. Uh, so it reduces the overlap, makes the representation sparse and reduces the overlap. And um, in humans, we can actually show that this is also the case with, with neuronal decoding, with multivariate decoding type approaches. We can see, we can look whether we can distinguish the representation of very similar things. So you see these rooms are very similar.
and the only brain region in the medial temporal lobe where you can decode that a person is looking at this but not this scene is the dentate gyrus. So there is also, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. So Yes. That's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. So people usually use quite incidental tasks, but that's a very good question. I mean, I think we don't know. I don't know if you know any data from animal studies also. Usually these are quite incidental tasks where, where this also works. At least you get the signal from the hippocampus. Um, Okay, so um, we know that, you know, so we can, we can look at pattern separation. Pattern separation is going to be important, but we have to also distinguish between the two pathways. So the what and the where pathway, which goes through the perirhinal lateral entorhinal cortex as an object or item pathway, and the parahippocampal medial entorhinal cortex as a um, where or, or, or you know, spatial context pathway. Now, this is quite nice to have this distinction in lateral entorhinal, medial entorhinal, but the problem is in humans, we don't know what the connectivity is. We don't know how the, con how the perirhinal cortex is functionally connected to the entorhinal cortex and how that differs from the parahippocampal cortex. And so we use, um, again, 7 Tesla to actually <coughs> delineate the connectivity of the perirhinal and the parahippocampal cortex to the entorhinal cortex, and what you find is, um, you can later, you know, read about all this in the, in the, in the information. Um, I think I have to hurry a little bit. What we find is this type of pattern. So you have an anterior lateral entorhinal region that shows preferential connectivity with perirhinal cortex, and a posterior medial entorhinal region that shows preferential connectivity with parahippocampal, and this is, you know, where we would expect the transentorhinal cortex to be. And now the question, of course, is, is this part of the entorhinal cortex, together with the parahippocampal, more sensitive to objects, uh, sorry, to scenes, and this more to objects? And what happens to that, to these stimuli um, in preclinical Alzheimer's disease? So first of all, this is a, this, these are data from, from Toronto, um, where they used exactly these spatial uh, layout to look at thickness uh, of the entorhinal cortex in a um, at-risk population of Alzheimer's disease. And what they observed was that um, it's the anterior lateral part of the entorhinal cortex that shows atrophy. So this part shows earlier atrophy than this part, which is interesting because, um, you know, according to Brag, it, you would also expect earlier um, pathology in, in, um, of tau in this region, although it's not really quite clear the data from Brock. There are some questions there. So we devised, basically, in the same population that I just showed you, we did another task where we actually now didn't present photographic images of scenes, but we presented uh, you know, uh, scenes and objects in isolation. So we segregated the contact that context, content that you would see in a photograph. And what you, what you uh, find is, uh, you know, a very nice dissociation um, in the sense that the anterior lateral and posterior medial part of entorhinal cortex shows selective sensitivity or preferential sensitivity to objects or scenes. So here is a different score. When it goes up, it means more response to scenes. So you see posterior medial EC more responsive to scenes anterior lateral EC, more responsive to objects. And, again, and interestingly, when you compare young, healthy young and older adults, you see that there is a significant reduction in the response um, in the perirhinal cortex. And uh, there's also a trend in the anterior lateral entorhinal cortex to, to objects already. So there seems to be something special about that object pathway. Yes. Um, we haven't looked, but it's probably quite subtle because there are only two stimuli. Um, yeah, but it's interesting. Yeah, we should probably look. Okay, now, um, you know, this made us more interested in, 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 in the behavior of this task. We said, okay, we should really have data across the entire lifespan. 
to see whether, as you get older, you have an earlier impairment in object discrimination than in scene discrimination. Because in this task, sorry, I haven't mentioned that, what you need to do is actually, you have to do something like a pattern separation discrimination. So you see these two objects are the same, but these two uh, are not the same. So you have to say that this is actually new because it's not exactly this one. And the same with the scenes. In the scenes, we change the boundaries. And this is a difficult discrimination task. And what we did is we, we went to Amazon Mechanical Turk. I don't know if you know this, but you can do basically online tests uh, with this platform. And we tested 2,066 participants across the entire lifespan. And the data that you get in the dis object and scene discrimination are quite amazing, actually. So here you see age. So we have the age range from 20 to 70. The dots are basically bins of uh, three years. So people you know, uh, within three years are, uh, are grouped together. And what you can see is that the object discrimination goes down quite you know, um, as, you, as you move about 55 uh, towards 70 whereas the scene discrimination performance stays stable more longer. And this would be very compatible with the idea that you have an earlier anterior lateral degeneration, um, maybe related, or dysfunction, maybe related to tau. And in fact, um, when we look at the behavior in this task, uh, it does correlate with the CSF tau levels. But this is not the entire story, because when you take amyloid into the into the ball game, then suddenly you see an impairment in scene processing. Um, so this is basically the CSF amyloid levels, and uh, we are now looking at the difference between objects and scenes. So uh, here, basically, when you have um, uh, better performance in scenes, um, you have less amyloid, tau uh, amyloid pathology, whereas if your performance in the scenes is worse than in the objects, um, you have more pathology. And in fact, when you, when you look, just, just to finish this, um, when you look at the difference between the objects and scenes, as you move towards MCI and Alzheimer's disease, you get a progressive impairment of scene processing over and above object processing. So what we are thinking is happening is that as you age, you accumulate tau here, that leads to a selective impairment in object processing, but as tau progresses and amyloid comes into the game, you have you know, a rapid decline in scene processing. So a kind of a cascading um, functional impairment. Now the question is, what does this early impairment in object processing mean? Um, and there is a concept that people have now attributed to the anterior lateral entorhinal cortex. They call it part which means primary age-related tauopathy. So some people say if you have tau only in this region, then it is not Alzheimer's disease, it's just age-related tauopathy. That's a little bit semantics now, but it will be important later when you start trials and so on. It will be important to determine who will be recruited and who not. Um, and if you want to read about this, uh, you know, very interesting debate, um, there's a very nice paper, um, oh sorry, I haven't put the citation in here, uh, in the Acta Neuro Neuropsychologica uh, from 2015 about you know, pros and cons of having that type of distinction. Oh, here, here it is. Yeah. Um, sorry, you had a question. I'm just confused about the data the last slide that mentioned between the performance and the object and scenes. Can you explain the power and the. So what these are the same Yeah, they're the same individuals, yeah. So how do you measure them as individuals? Because I thought you just sent something online with the data. Oh, no, sorry. Um, the behavioral data come from the same uh, uh, participants that also were part of the stale code study that did oh. the scene fMRI. No, the Amazon Turk uh, individuals, they are basically, um, they, we don't, you know, we don't have access to them. Yeah. Do you think if there were even like scrambled words, like there were like maybe similar difference better or recognize a point better? Scrambled words? Words like word lists versus like something they can recognize more quickly better than like uh, scenes or objects. Slight differences in scenes. Oh, uh, interesting question. Um, I don't 
I don't know. I mean, um, the problem with these the types of stimuli, so words, is that we have no idea how they are processed, what type of pathway they, they recruit, and so on. And we know, of course, you know, they tap into semantic memory, and they will activate all sorts of networks just due to their meaning. Um, but what we want to achieve here is kind of you know, achieve a pathway specificity in assessment that is difficult to achieve with words. So um, that's, yeah. okay. We have to move in, um, we have to move along. This is just to let you know that um, you know, if you are interested in this type of research and want to look at the morphometry, morphology of the enter of this region more closely, we have just published a new segmentation protocol together with people from the Allen Institute and University of Pennsylvania where you can look at the morphometry of the region very, very in quite detail. But, so let's come to the very first question. So we have a lot of data now with this scene, photographic scene task that I mentioned. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, this, this, so we have already in the Delcode study just uh, recruited 800 individuals. Uh, over 500 of them, meanwhile, um, so this is already an older, have come for a second year and people are coming for the third year. So we have tons of data. We have, you know, data of task fMRI from hundreds of people, including follow-up. Now the question is, um, what shall we do with this data in terms of understanding the representational problem that people have? So you have basically, you know, people looking at photographs, natural photographs, and you want to understand what are they actually forgetting? How would you go about this? Do you have any, any suggestion? Interview, this is now the part interview that... Interview the spouses. Sorry? Interview the spouses. Interview, yeah, so that's, that's a very good approach. You can basically have, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, an informant that tells you, that gives you, that enriches you about, about uh, the impairment. But that wouldn't be so computational and because you told me we, have, we should have a computational approach. So try to think of something computational. Yes, but you, were, you wanted to say something? Okay, I think this is probably too far. Yes, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, yeah. Morphing is very good, yeah, yeah. What do you do with when you morph an image? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But morphing is a great idea. We haven't done that, but... So the idea is basically, I think what you're thinking about is um, you, you, you want to change the image and see how that basically um, impacts on memory, you know, um, is there a part of the image that you can manipulate that makes it better memorable or less memorable? And then how is it related to brain activity? At which level of brain activity does this intervention work? Um, now, we haven't done any morphing, um, but we have used something that's called memorability. Now, memorability is an interesting concept because it turns out that when you look at, you know, when you present people such photographs, there are there is a constant feature across, across individuals in the sense that some photographs are more likely to re be remembered than others. So memorability is a constant feature, um, consistent intrinsic image property. And uh, there has been a lot of interest in memorability uh, because companies such as Google and Facebook are, you know, they think they can potentially make money off this. Um, but um, the, the, the positive side of this is that there's, a, there's been a lot of computational modeling of memorability. And, um, and, and deep learning and convolutional neural, neural, neural networks are currently being used to understand um, um, the, the, the um, coding principles, if you wish, the features that drive memorability um, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in these types of images. So we said, okay, we have this incredible data set. We have, un you know, unique photographs. So let's see what, what's memorability in healthy individuals and patients, and how does this relate to um, the functional activation maps that we have. 
Now, we haven't done the analysis. I mean, we have started, so I will show you some preliminary data, but there are other people who have already used that type of approach, not to look at patients, but principally to look at how, how basically information is represented in the brain. And I want to give you an example. So this is particularly the work of Radoslav Kishi and um, Aud Oliva from MIT. And, uh, and the idea is that basically with this deep convolutional networks, you can decompose images. Uh, they go through some form of a feature filter and then are basically uh, different aspects of them are, are represented in different layers of this convolutional network. But the important part is that you can use this layer structure and relate it to brain activation, be it measured with magnetoencephalography or fMRI. So in this particular study, which is very interesting, they just do pairwise comparisons and then look at the discriminating uh, convolutional network properties and discriminating um, MEG and fMRI properties, and then the correspondence between them. And what you see is that the early parts of the layer are coded more in posterior visual regions, and the later, more advanced sections of the layer, they basically, in the coding, move forward along the ventral stream. So this is just to show you that the principal approach works. Yeah. So the, the, the neural network is already trained. Uh, this was basically a study that uh, Wilma Bainbridge and uh, Odd Oliver did, also using Amazon Mechanical Turk, actually. They, they looked at how people uh, remember images, basically. They had a huge test, a set of um, thousands of images, and they did a memory test. So you train the network to discriminate Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is how that, well, um, actually, I don't know if this is the network they use for this particular study, but this, the network that we are using for our study is, is that uh, LAMEM network, yeah. So, so Wilma Bainbridge uh, from uh, MIT, she's now at NIH, looked at the memorability scores of our pictures. And what you see here are examples of pictures that all MCI patients remembered and pictures that most of them forgot. So there seems to be something very consistent about you know, that type of memorability um, in, in preclinical AD, if you wish. So, um, I mean, you can already spot that there's some, there must be some, something. So here, it's very hard to find a defining feature that would guide your processing, if you wish. Whereas here, there's always some defining element in the foreground. I mean, this is now just a, you know, just a very um, uh, crude assessment. But the important thing is, there, is this, there, there are stimuli that even MCI patients are likely to remember, and some that they are likely to forget. Yes? So what's the difference between memorability and salience? Well, um, I think salience is a contextual property. So you can have this stimulus that is obviously not memorable. You can make it very salient in a given context. You know, just may pop it up suddenly, then it's a salient stimulus. Um, I don't know if that would make this stimulus memorable in that context. That's an interesting question. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. So, you know, we're remembering the objects inside the scene. Like, how do you know what's the difference between like, a scene and a summation of objects? Exactly. So, um, so this network, this LAMEM convolutional network, now basically, um, uh, you know, we have the, the, the network neuronal structure, and we can now relate that to the activation map that we have here with the fMRI. And we can see basically which features are processed at which layer. And then we can determine from that um, how that relates to functional breakdown or to tau pathology. You know, we can use tau as a regressor um, in mapping the neural network layer to the fMRI. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, a complex, it's a complex endeavor, um, but I think the, the pure fact that you have this memorability, this constant memorability differences that you can see in these patients make this very, very interesting. And the interesting thing is, oh sorry, I think we, have, we, are, we are having a pause now. The interesting thing is you can even once you have such a network, do virtual 
perturbations, computational perturbations. So you can say, okay, um, if I have a lesion, you know, if I have a lesion in, in these uh, four layers, um, what's the consequence? If I have a lesion only in one layer, what's the consequence? So you have basically a model that you can start working with, um, which, which we don't have so far. You know, it's exactly that type of model that we need. Yeah. You lost me somewhere in the, in the conceptual development of this. I mean, you've got this absolutely fascinating selectivity, right? Spatial versus object memories, right? And you map this super precisely on your entorhinal substructures, right? And you do all of this because you want a marker to potentially, you know, not just detect, but also intervene. So why are you not just sticking with this? Why are we going now to this yeah. more complex memorability uh, features? That, that step I, I, I didn't catch. Um, I think, yeah, so yeah, that's a good question. So I, I think the object and scene discrimination part is, is, is a, um, you know, a very good conceptualization that may be very interesting for, uh, uh, you know, longitudinal studies to look at progression along, you know, across pathways, um, you know, as an, as an outcome measure for clinical trials and so on. It doesn't really tell us, though, um, how the memory of people with AD look like. We don't really understand um, the interaction between these pathways, and we don't really understand um, how it really relates to, um, to, in, to a situation which is, you know, which we have in everyday life where, where both types of information basically come in together. So, you know, I think it's a good starting point to, to make certain hypotheses. So we know that, um, you know, there is this early injury in the uh, anterior lateral entorhinal cortex. So it would be interesting to see whether there is a, a correspondence between network layers of this network and, and these pathways. Um, whether basically the um, uh, change in memorability score as you, uh, or change in memorability as you increase, let's say, tau levels in, in CSF, um, also allow you to map um, the memorability of these, mock, of these complex images to these specific pathways. And this is really, I mean, they are not, they are not different approaches. At the end, we want to bring them together because um, this is much more relevant for everyday life than, than just having the objects and the scenes. Yeah. Uh, so this, this idea of actually modeling the, the brain structure with the two dimensions is relying, relying more or less on the fact that there is something like between them. Yes, exactly. So it's a leap of faith with people. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, that's true. No, no. So this is really a project that's just starting, um, and um, uh, I'm I'm uh, optimistic because of the existing uh, data that people have published uh, regarding the correspondence. But um, you know, it's 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 complex and uh, potentially risky as a project. So it may turn out that the correspondence is not so good, and you know, um, we need other network structures, maybe you know, more complex or less complex ones. And uh, so it's really a collaboration that, that, that basically we need to start and it will, it, it is surely something that will require time. I don't expect that, you know, the first attempt will work, but maybe it will, so, yeah. So I'm um, coming back to this question, the interest about salience and memorability. Yeah. I'm wondering whether, you know, the broad distinction here between what um, I very loosely call bottom mm -hmm. cold Right. And whether since we're in a meeting on neuromodulation, right. how neuromodulation plays out in what of kind of memorability. Right. In one case, we're talking about information <coughs> processing in the visual yeah. cortex, like these great areas, as well as yeah. in the campus. In the other case, we may be talking about those you know, neurogenergic, serotonergic modulation of emotional right. content or something right. like that. So, yeah, that's a really interesting um, thought, and uh, I have to, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, yeah, I think it will be very important. So um, it could, I mean, um, that's why we have really talked about 
a purely representation, I mean, I have purely representational aspect of this saying that it's probably related to some cortical pathology of Alzheimer's disease. But it could, you know, very well also be um, the case that um, certain type of stimuli, um, uh, you know, engage neuromodulatory structures in a, uh, in a different way. Um, one thing about this particular uh, setup is that there is a complete counterbalancing across individuals. So, um, um, you know, it's not the case that everybody sees the images in the same order or so. Now, when you have the same order, salience would be a very important uh, thing to consider because it, it can very well be that, um, you know, when you have a lot of scenes um, that look, that look like, like this, then uh, something popping up with a human in there, you know, may be very salient. And uh, if that human is preceded in everyone by five images of roads, then it's clear that you know, people remember that human because uh, for everyone that becomes salient. But uh, as I said, it's a co complete counterbalancing across individuals. So we don't, I think we, ha we, you know, we have basically um, probably uh, randomized that enough to avoid that systemat systematicity. Um, but then we also don't have it, that information. So it would be good basically to look at something along those lines um, but in that particular stimulus set, we have actually eliminated that. So, um, yeah. Do you, do you have the, I know you said this at the beginning of this, you know, study, but at the end of that, do you think you can maybe use some eye tracking measures or just have some eye interaction where patients are looking at looking? Yes, we're starting with that right now, yeah. But that's very interesting. Um, I don't know when we were supposed to do well, it. If, you, if you're ready to break now, that would be a good time because we can then get cool. Yeah.